Hello, Falche. Welcome back for another episode of the Tawn, the reading of the Tawn Bokulnia or the Cattle Raid of Cooley with myself, Laura O'Brien. I have been working through this sometimes very steadily and sometimes very patchily, and it's been a little bit patchy lately, I have to say, but we are, I'm going to share my screen and you will see how close we are to completion. We are, as ever, working with the, um, the English translation from Joseph Dunn from 1914. And we have worked through all of these episodes, all the A, B's and C's. Um, and 27 was the last episode that we did. It was the Battle of Garrick. So we are now on episode 27A, The Muster of the Men of Erin. 28 and 29 are the final two episodes. So we have the Battle of the Bulls next time and the account of the Brown Bull of Coolnia to finish us off. So please make sure that you're subscribed to the channel and you hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss when a new episode drops and of course other videos on the channel. Um, if you are new to our reading of the Tawn, if you've just wandered in here by accident or you know fortuitously, then please make sure that you go back to, there's a link below to the whole playlist and the blog post that explains it and all your resources and all the good stuff and you have so much to look forward to because this is a really really well it's an epic tale literally and we um we've had a lot of fun i think reading it and commenting on it as we go through so episode 27a the muster here followeth the muster of the men of aaron the three Conora from Schlieve Mish, the three Lusen from Lucher, the three Neachorb from Tilak Luska, the three Dolfer from Dell, the three Dommeltok from Jerg Jerk, the three Buder from Buas, the three Beth from Bunigia, the three Bugelchok from Macbreg, the three Suvna from the Sur, the three Ucher from Ane. The three Malath from Loch Urn, the three Abatrua from Loch Ree, the three Mach Amra from Esrua, the three Fiacha from Fi Nevin, the three Main from Moreshk, the three Morajok from Marg, the three Lyra from Lechjerig, the three Brojunda from the Burba, that's the River Barrow, by the way. Um, the three Bruchnach from Ken Abrit, the three Deshkirtok from Drum Fornacht, the three Finn from Finnevar, the three Connell from Colivar, the three Carbra from Clu, the three Main from Mossa, the three Shkachlan from Shkara, the three Echtok from Erka, the three Trenfer from Chata, the three Fintan from Fevin, the three Rotanach from Rogna, the three Sarcharok from Suje Lagan, the three Etherskal from Etharbana, the three E from Edna, the three Gura from Gabal. So with a few little exceptions there, we are looking at a lot of alliteration and the Irish do love our alliteration and wordplay and all of that, especially in the original Irish. So all of these lads were gathering, obviously mustering. Then said Maeve to Fergus, if it were truly a thing to boast of for thee, wherest thou to use thy mightiness of battle without stint among us today? For as much as thou hast been driven out of thine own land and out of thine inheritance, amongst us hast thou found land and domain and inheritance and much goodwill hath been shown thee. So all of that is true. Uh, Fergus and his boys were um, exiled from Ulster because their king was being a dick, basically. And they recognised it to their credit. They recognised how much of a dick he was being. And uh, they ended up going against him and being exiled. So 
that is how Fergus and a load of Ulster lads ended up in Maeve's court with the men of Erin in this whole cattle raid. Um, so thereupon Fergus uttered his oath, I swear et reliqua. Now that's interesting. Um, often um, when you see I swear, it would be I swear on the um, I swear on the gods my ancestors swore by. So I'm just, I was trying to find it there, but I'm not really seeing it. Uh, if you can see that or what he is swearing on um, or et relica maybe means something else, uh, comment below, let us know. So necks of men I would break from necks of men, arms of men from arms of men, scalps of men from scalps of men, so that heads of men over shields would be as numerous with me as bits of ice on the miry stamping ground between two dry fields that a king's horses would course on, uh, courses racing. Every limb of the Ulster men would I send flying through the air before and behind me this day, if only I had my sword. So through this whole thing, as you, you have seen, if, if you are following along, Fergus has been uh, doing Maeve dirty, really, really doing her dirty, and Alil too, I suppose, um, the other one. So um, there's been lots of excuses, lots of betrayal, lots of, you know, trash talk, lots of um, helping out Cuchulain, uh when he should be being loyal to the people who, you know, gave him land and domain and inheritance and much goodwill this whole time in good faith. So um, I'm not a Fergus fan, I have to say, you know, getting, I never was, but getting to the end of the town here, um, I, I'm really seeing, or I have really seen his true colours. Obviously you make your own decisions and we are modern people putting modern morals onto ancient tales. So take all of that with a pinch of salt and make your own choices. So at that, Alil spoke to his own charioteer for Loga to wit. Fetch me a quick sword that wounds the skin, Ogela, said Alil. I give my word, if its bloom and condition be the worse at thy hands this day than the day I gave it thee on the hillside of Cruachany, thou, though thou hadst the men of Aaron and Alba to rescue thee from me today, they would not all save thee. Forloga went his way and he brought the sword with him in the flower of its safekeeping and fair flaming as a candle. So interesting description of weaponry there, um, the flower of its safekeeping and fair flaming as a candle. And the sword was placed in Alil's hand and Alil put it in Fergus hand and Fergus offered welcome to the sword. So Fergus at this point is speaking to the sword and he says, welcome Okhala Kulluk, which is hard blade, Lech's sword, said he. Weary, O oh champion of Bive. So again, we've seen Bive, um, Bive's name brought forth specifically about murder and killing multiple times through the town. So weary, O oh champion of Bive, on whom shall I ply this weapon? Fergus asked. On the men of war around thee, Maeve answered. No one shall find indulgence nor quarter from thee today unless some friend of thy bosom find it. So Maeve is not completely blind to maybe what's been going on or the likelihood that Fergus may let somebody off who is a friend of his bosom, which has definitely played out. So whereupon Fergus took his arms and went forward to the battle. Alil seized his weapons, Maeve seized her weapons and entered the battle, so that thrice the Ulster men were routed before them from the north till Kulnia and Sword drove them back again. So again, we see Maeve actually in the fray, in the fight here. She's not just some woman who's sitting back and directing all the trouble or causing trouble. She's actually in there with her weapons and fighting with the best of them. Concor, who's the Ulster King, heard that from his place in the line of battle, that the battle had gone against him thrice from the north. Then he addressed his bodyguard, even the inner circle of the Red Branch. Hold ye here a while, ye men, cried he, even in the line of battle where I am, that I may go and learn by whom the battle has been thus forced against us thrice from the north. 
Then said his household, we will hold out, said they, for the sky is above us and the earth underneath and the sea around about us. And unless the heavens shall fall in their showers of stars on the man face of the world, or unless the furrowed blue bordered ocean break over the tusted, tufted brow of the earth, or unless the ground yawns open, we will not move a thumb's breadth backward from here till the very day of doom and of everlasting life till thou come back to us. So again, this is very ritualistic and definitely incorporates the traditional Irish cosmology of earth and sea and sky. So not just in the first, um, the first kind of foray into it, the sky is above us, the earth underneath and the sea around about us. But they also talk about holding um, unless those things break. So that is the solid the, the steadfastness of them um, by the three worlds and unless the heavens fall unless the ocean breaks and unless the ground yawns open they're going to be there till um, you know doing what, what their king told them basically so interesting one to use ritually um, to use for promises to daisies to use for um, any kind of contract work just saying um, if you want to make it super serious. So Concor went his way to the place where he heard the battle had gone three times against him from the north and he lifted shield against shield there, namely against Fergus MacRoic, even Ochen, the fair ear of Concor, with its four ears of gold and its four bracings of red gold. So lifted shield against shield. So I'm going to say that uh, Ochen is his shield's name. So we're into the naming of weapons at this point. Um, that has definitely happened before, I believe. Therewith, Fergus gave three stout blows of five on the Ochen of Concor. So again, his sword would be five, I believe, unless the shield, unless he's calling his shield five at this stage. So that concourse shield cried aloud. It did say shield on shield. So the five could be the name that Fergus has for his shield because we have seen him talk about the sword that he re received, but it was uh, a champion of five. So it could be either really. Um, whenever concourse shield cried out, the shields of all the Ulster men cried out. However great the strength and power with which Fergus smote Concor on the shield, so great also was the might and valor wherewith Concor held the shield so that the ear of the shield did not even touch the ear of Concor. So if you can imagine the, the shield, um, if it was being, if it was receiving blows against him, it would often um, maybe give somebody a bang in the ear if they were holding it. So that did not happen because the shield held strong. Hearken, ye men of Aaron, cried Fergus, who opposes a shield to me today on this day of battle when four of the five grand provinces of Aaron come together on Garrick and Ilgarrick in the battle of the cattle raid of Cúlnia? A Gila, um, Gila, Gila again is servant or, or slave. Um, a Gila that is younger and mightier than thyself is here, Concor answered, and whose mother and father were better. So this is like, Fergus is the former king of Ulster, remember? So um, this is the, the younger and mightier king, to his own mind at least, is coming against the older king and, you know, claiming better um, parentage or ancestry. The man that hath driven thee out of thy borders, thy land and thine inheritance, the man that had driven thee into the lairs of the deer and the wild hare and the foxes, obviously when they were living wild, when they had no land or territory, the man that had not granted thee to take the breath of thy foot of thine own domain or land, the man that hath made thee dependent upon the bounty of a woman, weera, 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 um, the man that of a time disgraced thee by slaying the three sons of Ushnok that were under thy safeguard. So this is Concor boasting about the thing, the dishonor that he called um, because it was Deirdre and the sons of Ushnok. Um, he, he had a hard on for Deirdre basically. And uh, she was much, much younger than him and in love with Nisha, who's the son of Ushnok. So um, he's, he's taunting Fergus here 
uh, because Fergus um, put them under the, his his own safeguard, and you know they got slain. So the man that will repel thee this day in the presence of the men of Aaron, Concor, son of Fach the Nafahok, son of Rosrua, son of Rodriga, high king of Ulster, and son of the high king of Aaron. There was no actual high king of Aaron. It was just something that they all claimed. Just FYI, the whole high king thing is a fallacy. Historically speaking, it definitely appears in the mythology, but it was it was boasting, basically. Um, truly had this happened to me, Fergus responded. So, yeah, all that shit is true. You did all that. And Fergus placed his two hands on Cala Cullig, which would be the sword that he was given. And he heaved a blow with it backwards behind him so that its point touched the ground. And he thought to strike his three fateful blows of five on the men of Ulster so that their dead would be more in number than their living. So I'm guessing that the three fateful blows of five is a description of a warrior feat, as we have seen elsewhere here. Uh, Cormac Con Conlongus, son of Concor, saw that and he rushed to Fergus and he closed his two royal hands over him. Full of late, not of friendship in this, is this, O Fergus, my master. So this is the king's son. Um, and he's uh, appealing to Fergus's friendship, basically. Ungentle, not heedful is this, O Fergus, my master. Let not the Ulster men be slain and destroyed by thee through thy destructive blows. So these would be, um, again, the warrior feats would often have a supernatural element to them. So Cormac saw this coming and he's, um, he's trying to stop Fergus from destroying all the men of Ulster. But take thou thought for their honour today on this day of battle. Get thee away from me, boy, exclaimed Fergus, for I will not remain alive unless I deliver my three fateful strokes of five on the men of Ulster this day, till their dead be more in number than their living. Then turn thy hand slantwise, said Cormac Conlongus, and slice off the hilltops over the heads of the host on every side, and this will be an appeasing of thine anger. Tell Concor also to fall back again to his place in battle, said Fergus. So Concor went to his place in the battle. So obviously everybody was afraid of these, um, these three fateful strokes of five, and they were strong enough and powerful enough to slice the hilltops over the heads of the hosts. And also um, there seems to be uh, an energetic buildup or wind up that Fergus is already um, in the process of, which is interesting, again, from a ritual and magical perspective, um, that needs to go somewhere. You know, so that's kind of reading between the lines a bit, but, you know, that is how magic works. So, um, so Concor basically stops getting in Fergus's face, falls back, and um, thus it was with that sword, which was the sword of Fergus, the sword of Fergus, the sword of Lecce from Fairy. So we have an other world connotation here as well. Uh, whenever he desired to strike with it, it became the size of a rainbow in the air. Thereupon Fergus turned his hand slantwise over the heads of the host, so that he smote the three tops of the three hills, so that they are still visible on the moor, and these are the three males, the balls of Meath. So again, we have Dinhianicus, the, the lore of place name being worked in through the story, and you can really see, I think, through this whole reading of the Taun, how important the um, the lore of place and the connection to place is for our ancient Irish ancestors. Now, as regards Cú Cullen, he heard the Aachen of Concor smitten by Fergus MacRoig. Come, O leg, my master, cried Cú Cullen, who dares thus smite with those strong blows, mighty and far away, the Aachen, again, that's the shield of Concor, and I alive. Then Lake made answer, saying, the choice of men, Fergus MacRoy, who the very bold smites it. And then we have uh, some poetry. Blood he sheds, increase of slaughter, said Lake. Splendid the hero, Fergus MacRoy. Hidden had lain Fairyland's chariot sword. Battle now hath reached the shield, shield of my master, Concor. Quickly unloose the bands, Gilla, cried Cucullin. Then Cucullin gave a mighty spring so that the bindings of his wounds, because at this point he was still trying to recover from all of those wounds. So he's getting rid of all that shit now. 
and the bindings of his wounds flew from him to Machchuach, the Plain of the Bows in Connacht. So that would be quite far from County Meath. So this is supposed to indicate the, the mightiness of his spring, obviously. His bracings went from him to Bacha, the props in Corcomrua. The dry wisps that were stuffed in his wounds, so this would be the herbal treatments that he had got, uh, rose to the roof of the air and the sky as high as larks fly on a day of sunshine when there is no wind. Thereupon his bloody wounds got the better of him so that the ditches and furrows of the earth were full of streams of blood and torrents of gore. So obviously with all this stuff um, released from his wounds, he has, um, he's bleeding quite significantly at this point again. This was the first exploit of valour that Cúchulainn form, performed on rising out of his weakness. The two women lampoonists that made a feint of weeping and wailing over his head, Fehan and Colloch to wit, he smote each of them against the head of the other so that he was red with their blood and grey with their brains. Hmm, interesting colour associations there because uh, red and grey would be... Um, the bive, and I never put the, the brain matter together with the grayness of the scald crow or the hooded crow that we see here in Ireland, which is specifically the bive's creature or shape. His arms had not been left near him except his chariot only, and he took his chariot on his back and he set out to attack the men of Erin, and he smote them with the chariot until he reached the place where Fergus MacRoyck was. So he's randomly killing innocent people. You know, I didn't mean to just gloss over that. Um, who were uh, weeping and wailing over his head. So basically doing their jobs um, as within that society as they were supposed to be doing. So turn hither, O Fergus, my master, he cried. Fergus did not answer for he heard not. He spoke again. Turn hither, O Fergus, my master, he cried. And if thou turn not, I will grind thee as a mill grinds fresh grain. I will wash thee as a cup is washed in a tub. I will bind thee as the wood bind, binds the trees. I will pounce on thee as a hawk pounces on fledglings. Truly, this is my lot, spake Fergus, who the men of Aaron, who of the men of Aaron dares to address these stiff, vengeful words to me, where now the four grand provinces of Aaron are met on Garrick and Ilgarrick in the battle of the raid for the kine of Cúlnia. And again, kine is another word for cattle. Thy fosterling is before thee, he replied, and fosterling of the men of Ulster and of Concord as well, Cúchulain, son of Shultam. And thou didst promise to flee before me what time I should be wounded in pools of gore and riddled in the battle of the Tawn. For I did flee before thee in thine own combat on the Tawn. So this was a reference to an earlier deal that they had made where uh, Fergus was supposed to be fighting on Maeve's side and was doing deals with Cúchulain instead. So Fergus gave ear to that and he turned and made his three great strides of a hero back. So again, this would be a reference to hero feats specifically, um, which would be supernatural as in more than a natural hero would be able to accomplish. And as he turned, there turned all the men of Aaron. Then the men of Aaron broke their ranks westward over the hill. The battle raged around the men of Connacht. At midday, Cúchulain came to the battle. At the time of sunset at the ninth hour, the last company of the men of Connacht fled in rout westwards over the hill. At that time, there did not remain in Cúchulain's hand of the chariot, but a handful of its spokes around the wheel and a handbreadth of its poles around the shell, with the slaying and slaughtering of the grand provinces, the four grand provinces of Erin during all that time. Then Maeve betook her to a shield shelter in the rear of the men of Erin. So Maeve is going, is retreating as well um, and uh, is being sheltered by rows of shields I would presume so that's what that means. Thereafter Maeve sent off the brown bull of Cúlnia along with 50 of his heifers and eight of her runners with him around to Crocon. So they have at this point in the story they have stolen the brown bull of Cúlnia and Maeve is sending it back to Crocon to Rathcrohan where they are based because um, that was the whole point of the thon obviously. 
to the end that whoso might and whoso might not escape the brown bowl of Coolnia should get away safely even as she had promised so Maeve is keeping her word here then it was that the issue of blood came upon Maeve and this is this is one of the parts that um is very disparaging for for Maeve and for women generally but um she's uh, she started to menstruate here so then it was that the issue of blood came upon Maeve and she said do thou Fergus undertake a shield shelter in the rear of the men of Erin till I let my water flow from me by my throth replied Fergus tis an ill hour for thee to be taken so Howbeit, there is no help for me Maeve answered for I shall not live if I do not avoid water Fergus accordingly came and raised a shield shelter in the rear of the men of Erin. Maeve voided her water so that it made three large dikes so that a mill could find room in each dike. Hence the place is known as Fool Maeve, Maeve's water. Now this particular part, like I said, um, the issue of blood is a reference to menstruation, but then it seems to be a, a, a urine flow. My water flow from me would, would usually reference uh, urine and she's basically saying that you know I have I, I have to do it I won't live if I don't do it and um, this to me is very indicative of Maeve's original sovereignty aspects and um, the, the goddess Maeve rather than this historical or pseudo historical character um, of Queen Maeve and is one of the main reasons I think that uh, there's actually a lot. I wrote a whole book on Maeve. You can absolutely go and, and figure that out for yourself but by reading the book. But um, it is definitely one of the clues that would point towards her being a sovereignty goddess because the shaping of the land by her urine um, is a would be a pattern that would be familiar to people who are um, interested in reading about sovereignty goddesses. So, and even sovereignty deities. Um, the, the shaping of the land is very much uh, a Kailiok thing, an ancestral thing. Um, I know the Dagda does it as well. He creates plains and clears plains. Uh, Talchu, who would be a fur bullock queen slash sovereignty goddess, would um, would be shaping the land as well. So all of that is there. Um, again, to kind of read between the lines a little bit, it's not just Maeve needs to have a piss and Fergus is annoyed because uh, of, of bad timing. So Cuchulain came upon her as she was thus engaged on his way to battle, and he did not attack her. He would not strike her a blow from behind. I crave a boon of thee this day, O Cuchulain, spake Maeve. What boon cravest thou of me? asked Cuchulain. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that this host be under thine honour and thy protection till they pass westwards over Ahmore, the great ford. Yea, I promise that, said Cuchulain. Then went Cuchulain around the men of Erin, and he undertook a shield defence on one side of them in order to protect the men of Erin. On the other side went the governors of the men of Erin. Maeve went to her own place and assumed a shield defence in the rear of the men of Erin, and in this manner they convoyed the men of Erin over Ahmor westwards. Then Cuchulain took his sword in his hand and gave a, bl a blow to the three bald hilltops of Ahluan over against the three Mela, the, the bald tops of Mead that Fergus had sliced earlier, so that he, stuck the, he struck their three heads off them. <clears throat> so again, we see land shaping here from Fergus, from Maeve and from Cuchulain. And these would all indicate that there is... Um, there's more to these characters definitely and we definitely know that Cuchulain has otherworldly aspects to him he's pretty much the the demon spawn of the other world and uh Fergus in his in his actual sovereignty role would have um in his in his kingship would have been assumed to be part of the shaping of the landscape as well so um similar to um the Dagda examples that I mentioned a few minutes ago so then Fergus began to view the host as it went west westwards of Ahmor. It was thus indeed it behoved this day to prove for following in the lead of a woman. Faults and feuds have met here today, said Maeve to Fergus. Betrayed and sold is this host today, Fergus answered. 
and even as a brood mare leads her foals into a land unknown without a head to advise or give counsel before them, such is the plight of this host today. So Maeve has made some kind of a deal with Cucullin, maybe based on her, her power play with the, with the urine earlier. And um, Cucullin has agreed and basically she has secured the retreat of the men of Erin. And Fergus is salty about this. He's given out and he says that, um, that they were betrayed and sold, even though they were saved and led to safety and protected. But um, obviously that is, um, that is uh, the, the province of a woman the plight of this host being rescued and saved um, is, is shameful or um, dishonorable to Fergus. So then Cucullin turned to where Concor was with the nobles of Ulster before him. Concor bewailed and lamented Cucullin, and then he uttered this lay. How is this, O Cunha's hound, hero of the red branch thou, great woe, champion, hast thou borne battling in thy land's defence? Every morn a hundred slain, every eve a hundred more, while the host pervade thy fare, feeding thee with cooling food. Five score heroes of the hosts, these I reckon are in graves, while their women fare their hue, spend the night bewailing them. So Concor is pointing out that um, Cuchulun has been slaughtering all before him and this could be maybe some um, some issue that Concor has with Cucullin uh, protecting and um, letting go the men of Erin and why. So that could be where the wailing and the lamenting is coming in. So that is where we finish the 27A, the, um, the muster of the men of Erin. And like I said, we have two more episodes to go after this. So make sure that you are subscribed to the channel and you hit the bell for notification and join the mailing list as well because we do um, roundup posts on the mailing list. So we'll definitely be doing one of those um, by the end. So you don't wanna miss that because it has all the links to all of the episodes and you can go through if there's any that you've missed in, in, a, in a very easy format. So thank you for your time and your attention and make sure and hit like on the video because it really helps with the YouTube algorithm and let it play through because that helps to show YouTube that you want more content like this and obviously to show me that you want more content like this. When I finish the thon, I may do a reading of something else or multiple readings of something else. So comment below if you want me to continue once we finish the thon. Um, whether that's on a consistent basis or a hit and miss basis uh, will depend on my schedule, to be perfectly honest. I said from the start, this is a labor of love and uh, I still love it. I still love it. We've gotten to the end nearly, almost, and I'm still in love with Thon. I think it's an amazing story. So, Slongafol, and I will see you in the next video. <laughs>